To cut our carbon footprint, our family lives in a small house. We recycle, compost, and try to bike and walk. Our neighborhood shares tools, a trampoline, and happy chickens. We parents often discuss ways to keep our children safe. But climate change may be what threatens them the most. Recently, we realized that our individual efforts alone, though important, aren't really enough to address climate change. So our neighborhood invited two scholars to dinner, Dr. Kathleen Dean Moore, who lectures nationwide about climate change ethics, and Mary Christina Wood, an environmental law professor who originated atmospheric trust litigation to force carbon reduction. While our kids played, we parents talked about what needs to be done to protect the earth for future generations. It turns out a lot of people are asking the same thing. Every time I speak, the first question I get is, okay, what has to be done? So the good news is, we're faced with an open window right now, but we have to act on it. World's uh, foremost climate scientist, James Hansen, who is director of the NASA Institute for um, Space Studies, produced what we call a prescription for climate, and it sets forth exactly how much carbon reduction we need to accomplish to avoid climate catastrophe. Six percent a year beginning this year. Globally, it is achievable. The bad news is, if we wait even a few years, this 6% figure jumps to 15%, then 20%, then 30% a year. In just a few years, it becomes completely impossible for our children to cut carbon enough to stave off catastrophe. We need to stop building the infrastructure to support fossil fuels. So, no pipelines, no superhighway, no coal trains, all these sorts of things have to just stop. Mm -hmm. And instead we have to start building the infrastructure for the post-fossil fuel time, right now. We need a carbon tax, or we need cap and trade, or we need some other sort of governmental mechanism to reduce it. So we're going to have to have tariffs to force international cooperation with those two actions, because this has to be a global effort. So then I say to myself, okay, those are the three things that they have to be done, and they're all government actions. Mm -hmm. Well, government is doing exactly the opposite of what it should be doing. It's enacting policies for coal exports, it's supporting Keystone, it's supporting fracking. It's as if government is leading us along the plank to our own destruction with our children in hand. It's government that is our our tool for doing collectively what none of us can do individually. So how do we call government to that responsibility and help the government um, get the courage, help our representatives get the courage to do what we're asking them to do? The time has come for much peaceful protest. It has to be creatively outside existing processes mm -hmm. to attract attention and to change the norm. Yeah. And if enough people do it, it becomes the new norm. In social movement circles, I mean, the, 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 the phrase civil disobedience has been morphed into creative disruption. Okay. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a two for well, it. If it's creative mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you'll get the media. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, you, and so that builds wider awareness. If it's disruptive enough, then you bring, you know, powers of B to bear. Okay. They've got a force to reckon with you. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's these kind of creative, disruptive types of events outside the law or you know, just <laughs> walking that fine edge. What I call it is street democracy. Those are peaceful events. See, there's never been a major movement that has not been accomplished without street democracy. Could there be a group of elderly people in their best clothes standing in a line across the landscape where the seas will be in 20 years? Mm. Yeah. If there's going to be a clear cut in your neighborhood, could there be white crosses erected on every stump? Can we buy an old hearse and follow around the poison truck that sprays the wildflowers along the side of the road? <laughs> you know, it's playful, but it's deadly serious. Mm. And I really admire Bill Kibben when he said, you know, it's ugly out there and we can't ask young people to be the ones who are working outside mm -hmm. the law. This has to be the people who aren't in danger of losing their jobs. This has to be the elders. I want, yes. I want the elders in their very best clothes on these mm -hmm. During the occupation of Wall Street, uh, a number of my friends sent sleeping bags. Have we taken the time to go onto the websites and see what these people, what people need? Uh, one thing people could do is support my daughter and kids just like her in all 50 states who are suing their governments to compel them to manage the atmosphere as a public trust. My daughter goes up and talks to all of the governor's top environmental aides and attorneys, and they just shut up and listen because they know they can't 
They can't <laughs> BS her. Well, it's mm -hmm. Kelsey We're too, yeah. leaving them much more impoverished, <laughs> wretched. Is that because she's our, young? Yeah. Well, I think oh, it's a I big don't part know, of it. but they, they, they shut up at it. Amazing. If we can empower yeah. our children to not just talk back to our authority, but talk back to yeah, <laughs> right. government authority. I'm, I'm not the man. Yeah, There's the man. Stick to the man. <laughs> I've noticed that as well. When youth are in the room, the entire conversation changes. Yeah. And I believe it's because the youth hold the moral authority. Yeah. The best things we could do is to help our children voice their moral authority through letters to the editor, magazine articles, meeting with representatives and so forth. The, the Tea Party made such a hay, you know, cut taxes, cut the deficit, showing up at all these politicians, local events. Every public event should have kids right in their face. Mm -hmm. And they don't yeah, have to be rational. Like, mm -hmm. but they're not scientists and they're not lawyers <laughs> and they're not even eligible voters. But they're citizens still. There is another set of, of people who are, or, or creatures or beings who are relatively voiceless and one of them's future generations. Uh, another group is plants and animals that are so deeply affected by this and have no voice at all. And the third is the, is the marginalized, people who are geographically marginalized, but also people who are economically marginalized. So alliances with people um, we're not used to speaking with, or, or creative ways of giving voice to those who cannot speak, or creative ways of, as you've done with the law, of, of honoring the, our obligation in the future. We have to empower our own kind of creativity. And you know, getting beyond the spectacle of big celebrities or big experts, you know, entertaining us of sort and everyone, that's how we got to do it. I mean, I it's, yeah. turning your lawn into art is amazing. And At first, our kids were a little embarrassed. <laughs> and our neighbors, don't be, forget. You know, Becky was like, well, okay, what's going on with the garbage bags? <laughs> but now they're... You know, it's they become go, normal, okay. and mm -hmm. they're like, "Can we help set up the next one?" And yeah, uh, they drew all the postcards for this one. Yeah, and they yeah, yeah they made postcards. It's a neighborhood and, landmark. People and are now, like, oh, yeah. you're next to that house, yeah. <laughs> the, the art house. So rethinking the way we use our land, I think, is a really good one. Uh, I think to start. Yeah, you know, I've been calling on churches to start up programs of um, the new sanctuary movement. Uh, churches are often in the middle of these beautiful toxic lawns, but they oughtn't to be. These are places of, these are God's houses in the land. Everyone who belongs to a church believes that God created this world. And so how could they ever believe that it's all right to poison out native plants and to plant a lawn that depends on pesticides and, and toxicity and where children play and where their animals come? So everyone who believes that the church, who belongs to a church should also be part of the sanctuary movement and tell all throughout the community you have this whole network of wildlife sanctuaries that, um, that, that probably will link up. Every organization that has some of our money in it, our retirement accounts, our banks, our universities, we have to be putting pressure on them. I won't allow my money to be used in the war against the world. Which is what happened in, in South Africa yes. in the 1980s. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so regardless of the economic consequences, we'll probably make some people very rich. But at least we'll be able to say to ourselves, you know, my money isn't, isn't helping destroy mm -hmm. this planet. Stroll through any video store. It's shocking how much dystopian mm -hmm. sci-fi movies. Yes. The end of the world, mm -hmm. there is no future. And uh, just something I do in like in my classes, I say, okay, I want to hear an ecotopian future. <laughs> and I get them thinking creatively, what kind of world do they want to live in? That's the first thing, okay, then how we make it happen. Story. And just jar them out of this death spiral mm -hmm. mentality, mm -hmm. ecotopia, mm -hmm. the movie. <laughs> so think about what it is that you truly love to do. What, is your, what are you passionate about? What, are you, what do you love too much to lose? Mm -hmm. Take that and look around and see where the world needs you. I always imagine if I were at the edge of um, a river, if a child fell in that river and I knew it was, that child was gonna drown, I'd jump in and rescue the child. I think we all would. That's what we all need to do. We just need to say, there's a child in this river. It is, it's our children, it's your children, it's everybody's children. That's, in some level, that's what we need to do to wake up the world and to tell them, you can jump in, you'll be okay. But we need you to jump in.